Um, today, as the title suggests, I'm going to talk about some sobering things and then also talk about ways that we can move forward and what's going on here at Haas. But where I thought I'd start is U.S. News and World Report, for the first time this year, ranked real estate uh, components of MBA. And the Haas School of Business ranks number three in the country. Now, I think that's an error. I think we have and we will be number one soon. So this year, as Evan said, we participate in quite a lot of competitions. So uh, this year, we won every single competition we can turn. Uh, we just came to Stanford two days ago. Woo! Woo! Solving Sausalito's housing problems, our housing deficit problems, I should say. And um, we also are, we're doing combinations of both development competitions, financial competitions. And I think these are how we get out there in the world and show them, small though we are, we compete very well with people in New York, even though they have thousands of students. <laughs> so it's gratifying, and I think these competitions are really helpful in terms of giving experience for solving real problems with real professionals looking over your shoulder and measuring yourself relatively well. So that's the good news. <laughs> um, all right, so what I'm going to talk to you about today are things that we are doing here in the real estate program and Haas also under Anne's guidance and her effort to bring sustainability in a major way into the programs at Haas. I'm going to talk about why real estate is on the center of this effort and then how it's grounded with the other things that go on this campus. As you all know, this is a major science campus in the world. And partnerships between social scientists, especially financial economists like me, and the sciences is absolutely crucial. And so I'm going to talk about the steps we've taken to bring this along and work in the policy arena uh, to try to both enhance how we think about some of these problems and start bringing tools to bear to solve them. So I think this is a really exciting period of time, but the problems are real. So the first, the capital market challenges. So um, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, got a report together, which was led by Bob Litterman who was the commencement speaker actually in the Masters in Financial Engineering program about a month ago. And Bob is a Goldman Sachs guy, and he assembled a large group of actors from all the parts of the economy, the capital markets, from the banks to activists to various <laughs> players. And the goal of this was to put together a document to establish where the risks are in the US capital market. And it came out a year ago, October, uh, when our skies were orange. I was on the panel when this was presented in London. I was there to talk about fire risk in California. And literally, out my window, because I was on Zoom, I was able to turn the London audience so that they could see an orange sky in wow. San Francisco. So if we'd gone way beyond what's the long run discount rate. Yeah. <laughs> These are real issues. And Bob's goal, because this is the CFTC and the derivatives markets, and how we think about harnessing these markets to start managing and risk managing this risk. So basically, the idea is um, CO2 is a major important uh, pollutant that is uh, requires pricing and price signals in front of decision makers. What the issues are here is measurement. Uh, we have insufficient data. We have insufficient analytical tools. And I know some of you are working on these problems. So these are the opportunities that I think are really exciting. Uh, there's a lack of common definitions for some of these measurements. And there's a lack of corporate uh, disclosure. But obviously, all of you are reading the newspapers, and you know the SEC, 
is moving very rapidly. We're in the comment period right now for having uh, these documents as part of normal accounting statements. So progress has been made. This is now a document, and the CFTC is moving fast in developing derivatives markets that will support this. So this was a clarion call to the fixed income markets about what the risks are. So this is a little complicated, but basically to make a, a long story, a long graph simple, we know there are climate risks. Uh, we're working to try to measure them. We know there are going to be impacts on infrastructure. We've already seen them with the Texas um, meltdown last December, and uh, the, or a year ago now. Uh, the human health uh, problems, agricultural productivity. Uh, there are going to be a lot of expected economic activity costs. And we're going to have transition periods that are going to strand assets. And real estate is sort of ground zero on this, where there are going to be the assets that don't get updated, don't take this earlier issue seriously, are going to become stranded assets. And so thinking about what can be done and thinking about it sooner rather than later. And this is going to be true in most of the capital markets, and I'm going to talk about what they are in a minute, uh, is basically the purpose of this report and the purpose of what I'm going to talk about today. So obviously, I work on the mortgage markets. Mortgage markets are a big part of the United States financial system. Uh, we're talking about markets that are like $15 trillion large. Uh, this is they're written on the collateral. It's uh, the mortgage collateral are the, is the properties that are fixed in space, and they're very vulnerable. And as I say here, even looking at simple markets like the CMBS market, 20% of all CMBS in the United States right now is in New York, Miami, and Houston. Uh, if you look at residential mortgages, so after the crisis. I was brought in to help understand what California's exposure was uh, to the devastating effects that we were seeing in the mortgage market. I was asked to do that again in March of 2020 when we had a, a huge crisis in mortgage underwriting. We had a failure in the repo markets, which fund these markets. And so again, I was called in to try to figure out what's California's exposure. And the answer is just for residential mortgages in California, we have a $1.5 trillion exposure. That's just houses in California. And so understanding like which houses are at risk, what part of the capital markets are especially vulnerable, and what can we do about it, either hedging this risk or actually fixing the underlying exposures is important. And then we get to the obviously infrastructure and all kinds of uh, industrial markets and the financial assets tied to insurance, and then financial assets tied to streams of government uh, revenue, like this university. How does this university fund itself? Through municipal bonds. Well, uh, we're gonna look at where is this university? Municipal bonds up till now have not required higher casualty insurance. But unfortunately, given where we're located, and I'm gonna show you why in just a second, that's unlikely to be true in the future, which means that the funding markets for municipal infrastructure provision are now being reevaluated because of their exposure to fire. So here's our uh, concentration of the U.S. GDP. I already mentioned the exposure in C uh, CMBS. This is not surprise to anyone. Uh, where the largest part of the G uh, GDP is, New York. Uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, Dallas. Uh, these are uh, important centers of our economy. Uh, we've had quite a lot of shocks in the last period of time. As you can see, there's definitely, for those of you that are forecasters, the trends are definitely upward sloping. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> as you can see here in 2021, so just last year, uh, we have 20 separate billion dollar weather events in the US. And the, cost, the total cost of these was $145 billion. And the average cost has been, over time, in terms of how this is growing now, of nearly $152 billion a year. Just for this 
weather-related events. And as you can see, the one I'm talking about is just a little orange one. Uh, a lot of this green are the more coastal exposed to uh, hurricane and inundation risk on the west from the east. Okay, but here are our centers, and here are some of the problems. So here's LA and its exposure to fire risk, and obviously inversion layers and pollution caused by automotive uh, exhaust. Here's Houston. Uh, part of the problem is the excessive use of concrete that has paved over all the absorptive land, making Houston especially vulnerable, and that was one of the big circles on my GDP map. Here's Miami. So this is Miami, or what's left of Miami, as we get higher and higher sea levels, which are definitely coming. And the picture is not 100 years from now. This is recent. Miami's sewers are now flooding just with rain. So, and Miami, in its infinite wisdom, just passed a muni bond deal for a whole $400 million Miami forever <laughs> to fix this infrastructure. It's so disproportionate to the risk. And how difficult it will be to protect what is coming of the land mass with this kind of response. And that's part of what the CFTC is intended to do, to open people's eyes. Here's New York City. Uh, this is New York City infrastructure, and this happened again. This is Hurricane Sandy because the pictures are so great, uh, but it just happened again, this flooding, especially this area right here around the freeways. Uh, it's incredibly vulnerable. And the U barrier, which is a potential solution to this, is estimated to cost $119 billion, but it's going to require negotiation between New York, New Jersey, and Congress. Mm -hmm and it hasn't even started yet. So solving these problems and looking how other countries are already solving these problems, looking at the Rotterdam barriers, looking at the, bad, the barrier on the Thames to the start, storm surges coming up to London, and the cost of these barriers means that thinking of the Bay Area and making some kind of barrier on the other side of the Golden Gate uh, the cost of these things are very substantial and they need to be planned for. These are the infrastructure shops. And then we have the heat uh, island problems. I was going to show you Canary Wharf, which is just <coughs> glowing red like the sun, uh, but the glass sheath large buildings in New York City generate an enormous amount of and so as you can see, just the sidewalk, this was on a, just a day in, October, in August, the sidewalk here is 109 degrees here. So understanding these challenges, especially in our all-important metropolitan areas, all the agglomerated talent that's there, all the economic activity that's there is significant and we need to sort of be moving slowly in the direction of thinking about this more seriously of addressing some of these limitations. Okay, so as I said in the first slide, and this is part of the CFTC's document, metrics are a, a big part of this, of having good metrics. So I got the first finance-related grant from the Department of Energy that they ever funded, and that was eight years ago. It was the first time they uh, funded finance professors. It was joint with the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs with the scientists there. This is really in its infancy of collecting the data that we need to understand simple things about real estate and about our buildings and the cost to operate them and how much fossil fuel they're using. So, two, two things. Embodied carbon, which is the carbon attached to particularly cement uh, of the construction of buildings. And then the second, obviously, is the operational carbon. So most of my grants have been focused on the operational carbon. Uh, what we're doing in the classroom is we're evolving our classes, and I'm going to show you in just a second, 
to start thinking about both of these and thinking about how we can think more seriously about addressing and reducing the CO2 emissions associated with the operation of fuel cities. U.S. has an energy, really, waste problem. So this is a graphic that was designed by my colleagues at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs that shows for the big energy uses, real estate, residential and commercial, and then industrial and transportation. So the big users of energy in the United States, how much of that is utilized and how much of that is wasted? Like the radiant energy I just showed you in the buildings. The way we have our fans on the rooftops pushing air into the wind. In other words, non-veined air circulation systems on roofs. Simple mechanical solutions that we are not doing. Such that we are wasting about 66% of our energy that goes into these sectors. And that's where this is such an opportunity, especially, I truly really believe, for major business schools, working in partnership with the scientists that are on campuses like this and other places. So real estate has some responsibility here. These two pink boxes are important component of this problem. We'll start with the middle. So both building operations and building materials are about 38% of the um, energy or greenhouse gas and associated with energy consumption in the United States. So these are big numbers. Uh, one of the big issues, even in the grants I've been working on, I've, they've been renewed every year. We just got renewed again, so it's good. That money comes into our lab. Uh, is just understanding what the energy use per square foot of our large commercial real estate buildings is and then coming up with ways of underwriting what are good buildings, what are bad buildings, what buildings should be paying higher coupons on their debt because they're riskier, and what buildings can modulate the use of energy over, let's say, the 24 hours a year. Many buildings can't, they're either on or they're off in the US. This is much less true in Europe. And then when you look in downtown uh, New York, <laughs> As you see, 66% of the greenhouse gas is in the uh, business center in New York City. And a lot of it are glass, shield, sheep, relatively new buildings, especially those with lots of trading. So basically Manhattan, downtown, uh, that's where it's radiating the kind of heat of the Interestingly enough, the Nordics, and I taught at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and I was on an oversight council for them in August, um, have increasingly disconnected GDP growth in their countries with energy consumption. And that's something the U.S. really needs to aspire to do. We haven't quite achieved it, uh, but it is an important deconnecting the actual productive power of our economy with just reliance on fossil fuels. And very interestingly, the green line, that's the real estate part of energy consumption in the Nordics, is where they've made the most product of, of progress. <coughs> and so that's something that in the class, I'm teaching both the finance class and the investments, we're trying to get some of that technology in the classroom, much of it quite simple, well within the realm of existing tools, uh, as part of the set of tools uh, that our students think about. Go ahead. Uh, so is there one or two things that account for that green line going down, or is it a whole bunch of? It's, right, it's actually a relatively few things, which is what's so interesting. I'm going to show you some pictures of what so uh, they're doing a lot of geothermal. They're used doing a lot of closed loop water. And this is something now even Hudson Yard in New York City, the big development projects are increasingly looked at. We just sank a huge pier here to try to under, we have to replace our, our cogen. 
and we want to get ourselves away from the power of PG&E that has the power to cut us down. Um, and we are sinking peers to see how campus can solve a $700 million energy deficit problem. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping geothermal can be part of that solution. The Nordics are massively using geothermal. A lot of New York and the new developments in New York are also doing geothermal and along with closed loop water systems. So these are cooling tanks. This isn't like over the top technology, but it has led the Nordics to massively reduce especially their electricity consumption. Uh, the other thing is grid level energy distribution. So rather than thinking building by building by building, what are the chillers, what are the various uh, air circulation systems, we're thinking more system-wide and thinking about interfacing buildings and using technology that's actually being actively developed on this campus, both relative to solar and microgrids and other types of electricity distribution types of grids. And these grids are then between buildings rather than this building by building retrofit strategy that I think is less likely to be successful long term. That gets us to our classrooms. Mm -hmm. So around the Bay Area, you may have noticed, or <coughs> in the newspaper, we have some poorly functioning retail right now in the United States. <coughs> and we have very large malls with poorly functioning retail. So these are two one is relatively functioning and one is really not. Uh, two large malls. We're working, uh, last year we worked on both of them. Uh, the other <coughs> one is the Bayfair Mall. It's endowed with art and two major highways. This is a 70 acre site in the heart of the Bay Area. The other one is the Stonestown Mall up by USF. Again, it's a 50 acre mall and Prologis out here on Hilltop. We almost did three, but that was a bridge too far. Just bought Hilltop Mall, another non-functioning mall, with tens of acres of land. And what we're working on is, our, uh, is a laboratory using the MBA students. We masked the site for them. We're working with the city of San Leandro, who's working along with us, along with 15 other operating companies, including Madison Marquette that owns the site, to think about revisiting these sites as mixed-use sustainable developments with all these product types, retail, office, multifamily, and hotel. And as I show you, obviously this isn't very linear. We're trying to figure out how to do this such that we can integrate these services integrate the building uh, materials we're using for these. And each of the MBAs, I have 10 teams that are working right now on this site. Their papers are due on Tuesday next week. <laughs> <laughs> and this is really great. I mean, they've done all of the financing. We bring in all kinds of people to help them build these performance with new materials. So they're using different kinds of laminated timber. Um, uh, we just had a new one called Bamcor using bamboo, where uh, insulation is injected between pieces of bamboo, and you can go up eight stories with these materials. There are lots of really interesting things happening, and the students have really risen to the occasion. And then we present these to San Leandro and uh, firms that are working with us, including major operating companies in the United States, and the students are, each one of these are buildings or groups of buildings that they are redeveloping for this site, both in terms of the operational risk and also in terms of the construction materials. And then we're using the parking, so all the grays, these are parking redevelopments that are being turned into transportation hubs and energy hubs, and that's where our uh, battery systems, because we're linking all these buildings together, uh, will go. So this has been really interesting. It's been really exciting to see what they're, they've come up with. And uh, we are working away trying to develop for the, the cities here in the Bay Area uh, solutions for some of these very 
challenge sites right now, but amazing opportunities if things are done properly. Okay, so here's a typical building by building approach. So we solve the chiller problem approach, we solve the heating of the air, and then we have conduiting that has various expectations. Um, I have spent a lot of time with this doing the retrofit analysis and increasingly I think we need to think about system flows, especially between buildings. And there's a lot of very interesting work going on, like using these transportation, transportation hubs. There are scientists at Caltech that are working on ways where if you have EV fleets in these transportation hubs, which is what we're trying to do, we actually can use the batteries in the car to smooth the consumption cycle of electricity over the time, over the day. We can actually suck the electricity out of the, ba uh, the batteries and distribute it, and then come back with higher speed charging stations back to the cars. So there are a lot of things here that are relatively simple in terms of thinking about what could be done and integrated. So this is looking at electrification, this is basically heat, uh, heat pumps, ge geothermal piles, uh, uh, outside air systems, direct outside air systems, and then thermally active buildings. And th this is, these are actual buildings, uh, and the kinds of systems they're using within the buildings. And then our next step is tying these buildings together uh, on a microgrid. Okay, regulatory responses. Um, benchmarking is coming. Uh, California is a leader in benchmarking. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we require the utility bills to give us vetted information on your energy consumption. These are standardized so that we can see building by building what the consumption is. It started in San Francisco, or San Francisco was one of the early adopters, New York, Washington, and it's generated a lot of information about buildings that we use in the grants of our panel. Um, uh, New York City uh, passed in 2010 what was called Local Law 84 uh, that required buildings over 50,000 uh, square feet uh, to do benchmarking. And these data are all publicly available. You can look up individual buildings and it reaches to, to smaller and smaller buildings. San Francisco the same, only ours aren't as public as New York's. So uh, we do it, but we sort of keep it close to our chest. So they are not part of our data because you can't get those data. So we have New York, we have Philadelphia, we have Chicago, we have Boston, but we don't have San Francisco. So they were an early adopter, but they're not quite so sure they want you to know what the buildings actually are performing at. The Climate Mobilization Act, okay, so this is from benchmarking. The next step on this is once we know what the buildings are operating at, we can either use that for underwriting or we're also going to use it for carbon testing. That's the next step. And New York is, again, the early adopter here. Carbon taxes will be in place next January in New York. So you will pay a tax if you're producing more uh, carbon-related emissions relative to what should be true for your square footage and your tenants in New York City. But, of course, the regulatory responses are not linear and direct. So New York City changed, uh, passed the CMA. New York State was going to pass another even more, I would say, aggressive or um, expansive uh, bill, and that failed in the state legislature. So New York is on its own. There are rumblings, especially with COVID, that maybe this is a bridge too far. But as, th as things stand right now, New York is going to be doing this. We have people here from New York, so we can ask them. Uh, but this is real. These are real taxes. And I just had a speaker here from New York working in a major operating company in the Hudson Yard. That narrows it down. And he was talking <laughs> about <laughs> stranded assets in New York City that are going to be exposed to literally millions of dollars of tax because of their carbon emissions under the CMA. And I'm not talking about 2030 or 2050. I'm talking about next January. Question. Where is that 268 return coming from? 
Uh, that's the uh, that's the fee for any excess over the allowable within the building. That's the tax. I mean, sorry. That's the price of carbon relative that's being used, and everything over and above that, uh, you're going to be paying tax. And is there any relation between that and spot markets for uh, offsets? That's a great question. I decided not to go there. The answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> but the prop, I mean, solutions to this are buying offsets, only the market doesn't exist. And the offset market and the carbon cap and trade markets, I mean, all these markets that have to develop along with this for this to be really viable really aren't there yet. That's an amazing number. It is, I agree. Yeah. Well, it's much higher than the carbon is, so that's sort of a problem to begin with. Um, but, I mean, there's going to be infrastructure, and that's the point of the CFPC document. If they spend a lot of time on these markets, how are we going to integrate them? Obviously, you can't have a carbon market working in California, and one in Canada, and one in New York, and expect there to be some liquidity. It's just not going to happen. Oh, so we have to develop these markets. Yeah, go ahead, Arne. I would just quickly... New York and probably other cities that are enacting the penalties are not going to allow you to buy offsets. In New York, they said it has to come from what's called Zone J, which is basically the city of New York. Yeah. Good luck buying an offset that comes <laughs> from something that's generated in New York. Right. Sorry. So, that's, so basically, no. Fascinating. You have to decarbonize for, for pay. But the idea is to create an offset market. Do you want to take that now? Okay. I still would like to. I'd like to. We'd like to capture the questions. Um, when the taxes become due next January, as you say, mm -hmm. is it the case that there's um, will there be some unintended consequences? Is any has there been any modeling on what the landlords and the owners will do, and at what level of threshold does they kick in? Besides? So so the, it's fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. And it, yes, the answer is yes in many dimensions. On the leases, on the values of these buildings, I mean, how you would read a lease now, knowing that these taxes are due, and who's going to pay them, or what the values of these assets are, given this tax exposure, is something that everybody, especially all the lawyers in New York, in the way <laughs> full employment the way markets <laughs> operate in New York, this is a, there are a lot of unknowns here. Yeah. And le reading the lease rolls would be the first place I would start. Okay. So as you can see, there are lots of states that have adopted a clean energy, 100% clean energy policy. Uh, policies, and that does not mean zero fossil fuel consumption by any stretch of the imagination. But as you can see with my circles of where the GDP growth is, not all the states are moving on this in tandem. Uh, there are a lot of exposed states that are obviously doing nothing. So this is not an even picture, but there are a lot of uh, positive things. Okay, now we're going to bring it back to California. So California, as all of us know that live here, uh, has had a very challenging uh, several years uh, with water power. And uh, as I showed from the statistics we looked at the beginning, we're a big state. We're a big part of the capital markets. Uh, we're a big part of the mortgage market. We're a big part of the Fannie Freddie portfolio, which is a $7 trillion portfolio. We're a big part of the commercial banking portfolio in the United States, and for that matter, because we export a lot of our mortgage-backed securities overseas, we're a big part of the Bank of Japan portfolio, the Bank of Korea portfolio, and the European Central Bank portfolio. Because we <coughs> require fire casualty insurance in order to have a mortgage. And so understanding what this risk is and what's going on in California, since I assume that many of you are homeowners, uh, is something that we have decided is really something we're going to take on uh, working with colleagues of mine uh, here at us and elsewhere. So we, have, we know we've seen these horrific pictures in the newspaper, on television, and elsewhere. Uh, and just briefly, we've had, uh, since 1972, we've had a five-fold increase in the numbers of fires. 
Uh, since 20, uh, 2018, uh, 1.8 million acres grown, uh, leading to about $16 billion of losses. In 2019, we had two fires, both of them in LA, very heavily uh, urbanized areas. One of them was caused by a curb, a, t a tire hitting the curb, mm. and the other from a Tesla battery involved in an automobile accident, uh, leading to grass fires that went out of control and burned a lot of expensive houses. 25 billion again. 2020, there were more than 9,000 fires, 4.2 million acres burned. Uh, this was the Paradise Fire, which was catastrophic, huge loss of life and literally burned down an entire city. And that's when the muni markets decided that they were going to pay attention. Because how are municipal bonds paid for? With tax revenues, they're either tied to a service, like a library or some kind of a function that the city is running, hospital, or they're tied to general revenue. And they had never thought about a whole city burning down. Well, now they have. And so this is creeping into the insurance market, which is why I was on my list. But you're going to see California in many ways as an outlier, and that's what I want to talk about next. OK, and then we had very bad fires uh, last year, uh, especially the Dixie Fire that was largely in the national forest. So in terms of the many acres burned, but in terms of the magnitude of the losses, other than the cost of fighting the fires, uh, was relatively low. One of the biggest problems is looking at these data. So we are looking at hourly data over the last 20 years. We're looking at it in 1.5 by 1.5 mile per kilometer grid. So we've gridded out the entire state of California. <coughs> and we're tracking this hour by hour, day by day, over the fire months from April through, I know, November, but through October. And one of the things that you see in this data, starting from 2016, maximum temperatures really changed in California. There's been like a, almost a discontinuity of things increasing. So max temperature has really changed. And you can see that in this map. This is looking at 2018 relative to averages. And as you can see, the state is yellow and red, really seriously red, including in the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. So same with uh, precipitation. Relative to the historical averages, we all know this, we're in a drought. And the deficits are substantial. So that's just the reality of where we are right now. Max temperature is rising, and precipitation is falling, obviously. Another thing that's really rising is the largest land use in the United States, in the western states, is something called the Wildland Urban Interface. So this is urbanization right up against highly vegetated areas, leading to this area. This is, these are mostly, this one is, these two are Colorado, and that one I think is also Colorado. But uh, for those of you that read the newspaper, you know that San Diego just refused to permit a large subdivision because it was in the WUI and their EIR, their environmental uh, documents, had not accounted for it. Literally, it was just riding right up to the uh, foothills of the mountains. And it, the whole thing was off. So this is a big problem. If you remember the Colorado, the Boulder fire in December, that was in a wooly. That was all wooly area. And this is huge. And California has nearly all our development is in wooly's. And wooly's around highways, especially with Tesla cars that have accidents <laughs> and start grass fires, is a real problem. You can, most fires are either our infrastructure, our PG&E and you know, other a utility infrastructure. Uh, the rest of it is human or human stupidity. So this is a big problem. And this is showing you how recent and how serious this is. 
So as you can see from the most acreage, that's 1889 to 2016, compared to 2017, 18, 20, and 21. So these fires are hotter, and there are reasons for that max temperature, but also they burn hotter, and the wind is hot at higher velocities, and the damage is greater, which is what the second, second picture is doing, showing you basically the same thing, only from 1991 up through the present time. Okay, so now to California, so what can we do about this? So, some facts. All of us know, well, it is true, uh, that mortgages require fire, fire casualty insurance. They, they require homeowners in policy, and part of that policy has to be fire casualty. Public policy constraints in California, so we have a right, all states have insurance is regulated at the state level. California is no mission. Uh, the regulator of fire casualty insurance in California is the California Department of Insurance. Under California regs for pricing, CDI prohibits the use of probabilistic modifying models. So they do not, insurance is actuarial. What does actuarial mean? It means it's tied to probabilities. It, you can't just by dictate say, you can't use the tools of the trade to price insurance. But that is what's true in California right now. We are not allowed to use probabilistic models. Secondly, uh, they rely on deterministic maps that are not updated frequently. Sort of think about the um, inundation maps that uh, FEMA uses for uh, water risk or inundation risk. And then lastly, they prohibit the inclusion of reinsurance margin in the, uh, as part of the expense in the rate of approval. Okay, what is reinsurance? That's insurance for the tail risks. So that's very huge events, think 2017, 18, 20, and 21. <laughs> These are offshore markets that reinsure insurance companies for significant tail risks. It, it's unclear to me. Usually, I feel like when you, when you see policy like this, it's because of a, a, a stakeholder interest. Regulator. That's right. Yes. But I don't understand who, who is actually benefiting. So that is a good question. I have. So the question was, who's benefiting from this? There are. It's a cap. It's a captive regulator. It's a combination of activism and cities who don't want restrictions on where they release land for growth because that's where taxes are, property taxes. Wow. So it's a combination of those forces, and it turns out they're very powerful. But this is a very big problem. Now, after the financial crisis, I was brought in to work with the Federal Reserve System when we devised the Dodd-Frank bank test, the stress test. What we did, these are probability tests, scenario tests, of bank balance sheets where we stress them and they see whether or not they can survive. It's all based on probability. How did we solve the problem? We brought in a lot of statisticians to the regulator who could then look over the insurance models, or the bank models in the case of Don Frank, uh, to make sure they're good models. What is the CDI claiming they're concerned about? That probabilistic models can be used to deceive consumers. It's a very thin argument, and it's a problem because the pricing in California is way off base. What does this lead to? If insurance companies cannot increase rates, what's their solution? Drop coverage. Exactly. Their solution is to drop coverage. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal in January, Chubb and AIG have just left the state of California for insuring large, expensive homes. What's a large, expensive home? <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to do it anymore. Uh, the if you want sure. a policy from either of these well-capitalized firms, well, hey, Jane, you know, but Chubb, um, you are going to have to buy a different kind of insurance. 
and the cost of this is going to be double or treble what you were paying currently. Okay, so as you can see, non-renewal is up 31%. What do you do if you don't get renewed? Uh, well, you have to go and use the, what's called the California Fair Plan. This is very similar to the earthquake uh, mutuals that were created in Florida. Uh, also, how our we handle earthquake insurance in California. The Fair Plan insurance was never intended to be a widespread insurance policy. It is intended as a short-term sort of stopgap. It is also not well capitalized, and the policies are very expensive and a fraction of the coverage that you would have gotten from a normal carrier. So that's where, and as you can see, the increases are pretty staggering. These are huge increases of people losing their coverage, being forced into a carrier that they don't understand. Sure, they're paying a premium, but when the event happens, the whole idea is you pay the premium, and then when the bad thing happens, you get paid out. And that is not going to happen here. Go ahead. Just a, a simple observation, which is it seems to me that in California you've got the insurers in cahoots with the developers because ultimately you're, you're not ad adequately disclosing that risk. And so there's an incentive for developers to go into a place where they shouldn't be going because if you adequately or appropriately price that risk, it would, it would to your point, increase that insurance from three or 4,000 to 12, 15, 20,000 a year. I know this because I've got a place in Tahoe and Good luck finding insurance up there right now. Most I, of my friends can't. I can't. get it. I totally and, get and, it. And people are like, oh, but we can't price people out of the market. Then don't be in that place if you can't afford and it. And I think there are going to be some big suits because okay. I am very sympathetic to that argument yeah. in that there, this is a pricing problem. Right. Yes. It is a pricing of risk yeah. appropriate problem, yeah. which is where I started with the CFTC document saying, America, we need to start thinking about risk in your bond markets. Yeah. And we need to get the tools of the trade to do this properly. We can do it, but we need these price signals. And I think there's going to be a lot of this unraveling as the risk. I mean, we already are seeing signs of it, and we're going to see more and more. Yeah, question? Uh, I just want to say in. Six. Um, and we've had uh, a recent experience with uh, manufactured housing communities that we have an interest in um, that have been forced to access the fair plan uh, here in California. Uh, so it's not just big, expensive, you know, oh, yes, vacation homes. It's right. rural, affordable housing, market rate right. affordable housing. In fact, these counties, many of them are rural, affordable housing. Yeah. I mean, this is a really serious problem, and it needs to be addressed. Uh, because we need fair pricing, and then we need to figure out what the income redistributive effect of these new pricing schemes will be. Because there are going to be big winners and losers when we start repricing this risk appropriately. But first we have to figure out where the risks are, figuring out a pricing scheme that makes sense, so that we have insurance markets that can function, and then we have to solve the redistributive problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is it that is it that these insurance companies are basically dropping all coverage, or they're saying we'll drop, we'll take for this, but we are just we're dropping the fire and we'll take the rest? Because I guess in other states there is this fragmentation. Like we'll do this little bit for you yeah, and this little bit. Doesn't allow that. So that's why you have to, like Chubb and AIG. All or nothing. It's all or nothing, and there theirs is not a homeowner's policy anymore. They only offer this. I think I can't remember what it's called, but it's basically high-end property insurance, like insuring art. The way you would insure art in your home, you can use those policy lines for doing your home now. But the cost, of course, is not Right, and the coverage is not. Will you pass this that way? Klaus, will you pass so, that one? Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks, Klaus. Can I come back to uh, your prior presentation? First of all, thank you. This is really insightful and interesting. Um, obviously, um, I have two questions. As a homeowner in Berkeley, um, obviously not involved at the scale that you are, what can individual homeowners in Berkeley do to address this? That's question one. Question two is, so the solutions you've shown are for mall developments and bigger developments. 
you have similar thoughts going on for existing real estate, let's say in San Francisco, some of the office buildings or so, how we don't have to wait to replace all of them, but could, what could be done on a more gradual level to address that problem sooner? Yeah, so I'm very sympathetic to all of this. So I lost my home in 1991, uh, where 25 people died, and we lost 3,000 houses. Yeah. And it was like it happened and then everybody forgot. And so I've sort of begun to take this seriously and starting talking with the Cal Fire people that went in and did the retrospectives on this, on the streets that burned again and again and again, including in Berkeley mm -hmm. and in Livermore and in many other places, Santa Barbara, where literally the same streets burn multiple times. Why is that? Who is watching them? And I agree, This is uh, this, the cities have trouble with this because of the liability. Everybody's passing the buck to some higher authority, uh, but this is the higher authority, and this is the governor's office, and that's where I think the pressure needs to happen now in terms of how we're going to address this problem. Because these are state agencies, and the political pressure has got to be at the state level. It's also true in the city of Berkeley, though. Do they clear brush? Answer, no. Mm -hmm. Or the city of Oakland that's had multiple fires, so is Berkeley. Do they really enforce the brush? Cool. I mean, it's sort of a joke when the fire people walk around and everybody gets a golden star. <laughs> Even though the trees are like beating on the houses. Mm -hmm. So this is a local problem, but it's also a state level problem. And, it's and we are especially vulnerable to it, and I think it's bad enough now that people really do have to start addressing this. So I think it's you know, getting Gavin Newsom to understand that it, Gavin Newsom is very focused on the national force. And that's well and good. I think fish products are in his watch. We're in the national force, but the, the risk is in the urban areas. That's where the wealth is. That's where the industrial base is. That's where the risk is. And he needs to sort of get off this. We're trying, but you know, we haven't made that many problems. But I'm going to keep this positive. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as I say, I'm, this whole purpose of this work we've been doing here with our lab, we have 82 terabytes of data. We have basically all the mortgages in the United States. Their performance month by month. Uh, for everything, we have all the properties in the United States, every mortgage that every house ever had, who lives in those houses, what their wealth is, where they move to. We have a lot of information about how these markets work, and that's the purpose of this paper. So we joined forces with uh, the California Department of Agriculture, Cal Fire. Uh, we have a really good set of amazing people that go in and diagnose these fires. They're scientists, many of them are trained at Berkeley. They go in, they walk the, the sites, they figure out what the um, ignition events were, what the provocation events were, what exactly happened, and then they document house by house by house by house what the damages were. We use all of those data. You know, we just vacuuming it up and put it in our database. <coughs> our data set has 9,000 fires. There's a lot of fires. And uh, we're interested in a couple things. What happens to the housing markets after fires? Uh, is there gentrification after fires? Uh, what is the exposure of mortgages in the state of California after fires? And is this risk estimable? So what we do is we take all of these red things and we turn them into a treatment, which is where the fire was, and then rings around that treatment to look at the effect of these, think of them as a natural experiment, a shock of a fire on the loss of houses, and how that spills over to other areas, and who the winners and losers are, of course. Okay, so we know in California, and most homeowners policy, also a little known fact, less than 1% of people that have homeowners insurance have ever read their policy. <laughs> I gave this paper at Stanford GSB about 18 months ago. 
the finance faculty at GSB had not read their policy. <laughs> and three of them had just lost their insurance and been told to go to California Fairfax. And they were slightly apoplectic about what this happened. So homeowners policies are complicated. And when it happens, your policy usually is burned up, and you haven't read it. <laughs> and you are up against, in California, rebuilding with many, many people trying to rebuild at the same time. So the cost of rebuilding is a moving target here. Nancy, uh, you mentioned the Colorado fire. I saw an article the other day that said there was two, yeah. There was two neighborhoods side by side. One was built in the 60s, one more recent. Yeah. The one in the 60s all burned down. The other one, more modern building code yeah. that was stood. I see up there you have building codes. That's kind of if your house is already burned down. But are there things from a treatment perspective yeah. or other things that people can do to make yeah. their housing more resilient? Definitely. And that's what Cal Fire is trying to do. So they go in, they know what the house was before. They know how much was destroyed. And typically when a house catches in these fires, it burns to the ground. And now what they're seeing is there actually is a difference between things built post-2009, their survivability, and things built pre-2009. It has a lot to do with the windows. Are they double pane? Are they steel frame that are soldered? What the roof treatments are and what the siding treatments are. And then whether or not there are eaves, that there's anything like porches that overhang the land. Because basically this is just rings of tiny pieces of ash, of burning embers, tiny like thick fingernails. So is there a scenario where you have funding for homeowners to take these measures proactively? Yes, and that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, that's where this should be in the MBA classroom. These are bond markets. Where do you fund things like that? With bond markets. If you put a, you could use seed paste loans here for hardening homes. It's totally doable. We just need to figure out what their regs are or to write it down so that mere mortals can figure out what the right thing to do is and then help them find the sources of capital to do it. And you do, when you don't want to do it is when your, your home is no longer there <laughs> and your insurance company in California has incentives to force you to rebuild on the same lot that just burned. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what the incentives are in these policies. I know because I've read them. <laughs> <laughs> so everything is being rebuilt in exactly the same risky places that were already there. The only saving grace, which is what Ari just pointed out, is that you are required to build to code. That means to the earthquake code, to the fire codes, to every other code, and that's costly. <coughs> And now the insurance is sort of starting to price those riders. It costs more if you buy insurance and enables you to truly build the code. But the only place where you have some fungibility is with your personal property. You don't have to actually buy that to get refunded. And so what most people do is they put it into their house. So what does that mean? Houses are newer, and they usually are bigger. In California. Okay, we have very large data sets. We use machine learning. We group, we join these together. Uh, these are very complicated data sets. Uh, we then add to these uh, all the climate data. In particular, we have meteorological data. I'm going to show you in a sec. Uh, we have topographical data. We know the slope and we know the elevation of every single house in California. We know the vegetative and urban uh, surface coverage for those data uh, for the, the stock of housing in the state. And what we find is that these are eminently estimable risks, as anybody that works in this industry knows. These are estimable risks. And what we find, and one thing I was especially interested in, you've heard about Diablo winds, right? You've heard about Santana, so Santana's are the scary thing in the south because they've been dangerous winds for a really long time. These were identified as a vector of fire in the 1940s in Southern California. Diablos were considered more benign. 
until the Oakland Hills fire. That was deemed a 100-year event. And now the Diablos are as or more risky than the Santanos. And that's what those two blue covariants are. We spent a lot of time and effort measuring the hour-by-hour hour presence of the speeds of these winds that come from the Central Valley to the sea. In other words, when there's an inversion layer in the, in the Pacific. And they are very, very dangerous. <coughs> so we estimated these things. We compared our estimates with the CDI maps. The CDIs are on the right, and as you can see, there's a whole lot of California that's white. And the bright orange and red is our estimate at 1.5 by 1.5 grids on a, a, a day in October. There's a lot of risk here. There are a lot of houses that are not accounted for. These are the maps that are used for the pricing schemes of the CDI. They're fixed. They're deterministic. And they're wrong. Okay, so what's the end result of the study? Uh, we find that there, there are important effects on the houses. They're bigger. Uh, they're, they're more valuable uh, because people capitalize their personal property into the house. And uh, everybody knows that uh, given the policy, the way the policies are written, that everybody has to rebuild in order to maximize the payout on their policies. So you know that, that sort of solves the remodeling problem, and so people are very willing to go into their houses. So that's great, except where it costs a lot. And it costs too much. And that's why the insurers are not going to stay in the state. So the incentives are totally upside down. And we find, interestingly, um, that, so bigger house houses, people are wealthier post-fire, uh, and the houses are larger. Mortgages, sure, there's a little bit more delinquency after a fire, but after a really big fire, like the Oakland Hills fire or the Santa Barbara fire, almost nobody defaults. Why? Because they're built, busy building bigger, more valuable houses, and so they don't default. But this isn't sustainable. The cost of rebuilding this ho these houses relative to the cost of fighting these fires and the hits the insurance companies are nearly, there's nearly a threefold difference. So sure, the past fires, the beneficiaries are the people that were insured and rebuilt, but this is not sustainable, and that's what the insurance company industry is telling us. Uh, so as we see, shocks to uh, wind, uh, shocks to max temperature lead to big changes in terms of exposure to fire. This is on one day uh, in expectation. The overall wildfire cost in California exceed that threefold. So it's not sustainable. And the private insurance policy renewal rates, I already showed you those statistics, are not happening for this reason. And what this means is we really need to think, rethink how we price fire casualty insurance in this state. We need to get price signals in front of the decision makers that are deploying expensive resources how to build houses and real estate in this state. Thanks very much. Guys, we, I think we have about Maybe a couple two or three minutes for a couple more questions, if there are any in the audience. Do you have an opinion on uh, like um, met risk metrics? Uh, the one that comes to mind for me is MSCI's climate value at risk, mm -hmm. and how that might apply to um, like revaluation um, in terms of helping price these risks in. So um, we're working on the forecasting models for doing exactly this. And my view of this is unless you have really good metrics, especially on the climate side, uh, it's, that's challenging to do. So basically, I have teams of MFEs working on 
these forecasting models, I mean, just think of this. The state and my world is this tiny squares. Each one of those tiny squares is a panel of information, hourly meteorological data that we aggregate into months and days in various ways. And each of those is a forecasting problem. But, and things that are close together, obviously you think are highly correlated. But it also matters whether you're at the peak of a mountain range or somewhere else on the slopes. So it's a complicated forecasting problem. But we've made a lot of progress, and that's what we're working on right now. Because the nice thing is different from mortgages that are 30-year forecasting in the future problem. Insurance products are annuals. So you only have to go one year out of sample for this. And so I'm actually quite optimistic that we can do a good job with these one year out of sample with good metrics data and pricing house by house. So that's another thing that's happening with inundation risk. So that's the National Flood Insurance Program, which is hopelessly underfunded and a big mess. And we just reset how we do this pricing. And the next thing that happened in November is Chuck Schumer got on the floor of the Senate and said, New Jersey is not going to pay these insurance prices. <laughs> I mean, it's a total political football. But the change in the new NFRP is they price house by house. And that gets back to your question, is if houses harden themselves, they should benefit in the pricing. And that's why the data sets that we have that are house by house. So I pay, I have convinced a vendor to give me a snapshot of exactly what houses look like year by year. Additional bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage. So I actually know what the houses look like. So that we can monitor this and price accordingly. And houses that do the right thing should be part of the fire. That's your question, Stephanie. And are there winners and are yours? You know, who are the good houses? And then uh, figure out ways of providing mortgage products or funding products to help people. And that's mm -hmm. what I think has to happen. But if, until we get prices in front of people, they're not going to do it. That's the problem. I think we're, unfortunately, I think we're at time, Nancy, if you're able to hang out a little bit sure, after this. Sure. But uh, incredibly important topic, and thanks so much for keeping this positive. Thank you all. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Nancy.